Hello everyone, this is PDH Pal Deej, making another deck tech. This one is extremely demanded um, by me. It's my favorite commander ever, Oriok Salvagers. You can think to yourself, hey, it's mono white. How can a mono white commander in any format, let alone popper commander, be anyone's favorite? Well, Oriok Salvagers has a special place in my heart, and I'll show you why. Here's his ability. It says pay one white and one, it's hidden by a signature, but I'm, I assure you this is what it says. To uh, return an artifact that costs one or less from your graveyard to your hand. There are a lot of artifacts in this deck, um, most of which are targets, that you're able to just recur. So even if you draw just one, you can spend all of, all of your mana every turn just casting the same artifact every turn. It's basically eggs in, in Popper. On the screen you'll see a, a little cheeky two card combo. Ghoul Caller's Bell and Lens of Clarity. I put it in the category of cards that probably shouldn't necessarily make the cut, but I love them so much, especially together, that I refuse to take them out. Independently, they're both pretty good, and we're just going to start here. Ghoul Caller's Bell is an artifact, so it's a target for Oriok. It doesn't put itself in the graveyard, so it's not necessarily something you're going to be looping every turn, but it does fuel your engine. If you just mill, every card, uh, mill a card every single turn, um, you'll be milling your artifacts you can return, so you're, you're slowly increasing your card selection of things you, you want to recur, recur with uh, Oriok Salvager himself. Lens of Clarity standalone might seem really useless. All you do is look at the top card of your library, but you have a few interactions that give you a lot of benefit for that. Um, for example, we have a few eggs. This is a category of uh, land recursion or just land acceleration in some way. Where First Bob is a great example. It shuffles your library. It's also a uh, ramp. So this is one of the best cards to loop with Oriok Salvagers. You're, you're spending five mana every time to do it, but you're, you're ramping up your mana so much every turn, eventually you know, you're going to be able to cast uh, Wayfarer's Bobble multiple times a turn. These three are a little bit slower, but I like them almost more because they're more consistent. All you do is spend one mana uh, maybe two mana on that turn if you want to be aggressive with it. But it just ensures that you, you don't miss your land drop every turn. So the secondary benefit is you're shuffling your library. But uh, they're really nice for making sure you, you, you get your lands for turn, thinning your deck, shuffling, and uh, yeah, you can just loop them. It, it's really nice to just dump your mana into Oriok sometimes, just return these out of your grave. The best one of these is Expedition Map. Uh, so one of the strategies is to very slowly spend a ridiculous amount of mana on Wayfarer's Bobble, so you can spend all that ridiculous mana on more Wayfarer's Bobbles until you can't do it anymore, and then you're able to loop other things. There's a more direct route that costs less mana to get you more mana faster, and that is using Expedition Map for the Tron lands. Um, if you hit one Expedition Map, you are almost guaranteed, as, as long as you're able to pull up enough mana to protect your graveyard from Grave Bombs, using Expedition Map to eventually, inevitably, hit all three Tron lands. So Expedition Map might be the best card to loop, and uh, I'm going to have a hard time not saying that about a lot of the eggs. So that's it for the ones that hit lands, and those are mostly the biggest justification for Lens of Clarity, besides Lens of Clarity and Google Colors themselves, because this says look at the top, if you like it, you don't mill. If you don't like it, you do. That's the combo I love. Um, but when it comes to actual powerhouse eggs, these are the ones you want for consistency. These are the ones that, engine, that power through your deck. Uh, these are the best of the draw eggs. Because it only costs three mana total to, to net a card. So as long as you're sitting on enough mana to actually loop Oriok the way you want to, you're able to spill your hand and grind through your deck and start churning. Um, yeah, so that's their biggest benefit. They, they, they cost one less than the other draws. Uh, there is one more in this category. It is slower, and it's, I, I would argue it's an on-the-fence pick, but since it fits that category of only costing three mana, you really don't mind that you draw the card uh, at the beginning of next turn's upkeep. Depending on the state of the game, it might actually be worth it to loop this over something like Chromatic Star or Chromatic Sphere. Because... Yeah, you won't have to discard a hand size. I actually don't run any artifacts in here that help me uh, not discard it in a turn. 
So opting into this or just actually playing the eggs themselves is the only way to make sure you, you don't discard a hand size. So those are draw cards that cost less mana per turn. These are the ones that have extra benefits. We do have a sub-theme in this deck, which is Changelings. Um, it, would, it is a sub-theme. It's very weak. Uh, we're not leaning into it too hard, but it's specifically for Scroll of Avacyn. So Implement and Sunbeam Spellbomb, these are some of the best win conditions, and it seems weird that an egg that would cost you four mana per activation to gain you five life is a win condition. But when you're not trying to gain life that, it also just says you draw a card. So this can cost four mana to draw you cards, or in the late game when you, know, you just need to stabilize, you're able to take a turn and just dump all your mana into gaining something like 30, 40, or 50 life, depending on the state of the game. A lot of it's based on pressure. I try to hold back on this. Um, if you just start trying to gain life early, then everyone's going to start training you. Uh, they're going to ensure that you don't just pool up life. So it's better to keep this hidden and wait as long as possible and just blow everyone out with too much heal that no one can handle. Um, if you want to be incremental with it, Implement of Improvement is great because it's basically both of these abilities combined. You're spending four mana because the one and the one to gain two life, but you also draw the card. So you're gaining less life, but you're also churning. So this is a good one to grind with because everyone understands that you're, you're spending four mana to draw. They're not necessarily going to target you as hard. This is the one where it's like, oh, you're just gaining life. You're just trying to make it so no one can ever kill you. Scroll of Avacyn is great because it's both combined, but it has a condition. If you want both of these effects combined, the five life and drawing a card, then you need to control an angel. And there actually used to be an angel in here. I recently cut it. Now the only angels are changelings themselves. Um, so the other payoff card for changelings is Scroll of Grizzlebrand, which might be one of the best win cons. But these three cards are the actual win cons. These are the cards that go are going to end the game. Um, the reason why my friends that I play with for years groan when I play this deck is because I am going to be spending, in this case, four mana for every two damage to kill you. So once I have the game completely stabilized to the point where I'm comfortable, that's when I start burning all my excess mana, just very slowly shooting you in the face uh, for two damage. And the same goes here. Uh, it costs less mana, but it requires me to tap my creatures. So I'm not able to do too many activations, depending on how many creatures I have. Um, so that's the win condition, is just, just playing stalling the game out, game out and shooting down stuff until you eventually burn their face. The, game, the, the games usually end in a concession before an actual victory. But Scroll Grizzlebrand fits in the same category. This is a really great control card. Instant speed, instant speed discard, even if you don't have the demon, is extremely powerful. When they draw for turn, you can just, especially if it's their last card in hand, you just, uh, in their upkeep, you, uh, or I suppose after, uh, after their upkeep, during the start of their main, you pay one mana, and they discard the card they drew. If you control a demon, it also does three damage. They lose three life. So, yeah, these are the cards you actually loop to, to kill people. The benefit of these is they are also removal. So this is a control spell, and these are technically control spells because you're able to, to blast creatures. Every, every card in this deck has dual functionality, in the very least. So other cards that we, we recur, uh, these are the most mana costly. Really just these two, um, but they're extremely powerful. They're hard removal. Destroying an enchantment and an artifact over and over and over again, it doesn't really matter how much mana you're spending on it. If there's a key uh, artifact or enchantment on board that you need to destroy, this can just lock down the game. You're, 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 sp you're spending tempo to get destruction. And the same thing goes for Universal Solvent. The, game, the games that I think are too grindy is when Universal Solvent is actually the correct play. Um, very rarely do I actually want to loot this, but the threat of it is powerful enough that it definitely deserves a spot in the, in the deck. Tormod's Crypt is my best answer to any sort of graveyard shenanigans and graveyard combos that people might be running. Uh, Rune Stalactite is the first card in my deck that gives Changeling. It is great because if I mill it or if someone else mills me, which mill is prevalent enough in our meta, uh, Ghoul Caller's deck, Ghoul, Ghoul Caller's Bell is in a pretty healthy portion of the deck, so just accidentally milling it isn't that big of a deal because I'm able to get it back. But yeah, almost always I'm just going to draw it and play it. Um, the nice thing is that since I'm able to occur it through mill or if it's destroyed, it always comes back. So if I draw this early enough and nobody threatens my graveyard, then I'll be able to replay 
these uh, changeling payoff cards that are really quite powerful on their own. So that's a re real benefit of that. I mean, also getting 1-1 one, one is pretty nice. The, there's a secondary added benefit that I'll show you guys once we get into the enchantments that every creature type, uh, that having changelings themselves also benefits. Um, Felden's Cane. I love this card. It doesn't actually do anything very progressive uh, when it comes to uh, solidifying your strategy, but it's really great defensively. And again, my, clay, my play group, we actually have Mill in our meta. It is kind of silly, and my deck does stand to benefit from it, but I can lose just like anyone else. My win condition is not fast enough. I will actually be outpaced by Mill in Pauper Commander. That's kind of the, the cost of being mono white. But Felton's Cane, as long as it's not in my bottom 10 or so cards, at some point you'll mill it, at some point I'll get it back, and if I can get it into play to resolve, then all of a sudden you have to mill me twice as much as you were anticipating. The power of that, and the fact that it's just flat out grave protection, I can, um, I can play it one turn, and if I'm dealing with a, a menagerie of Tormod's Crypts or Relics of Progenitus, that they're all focused on my graveyard, because I'm clearly the threat when it comes to uh, graveyard disruption, then they can't just all gang up on me. I, I, can, I can save up my mana. Oriok Salvagers can have three, four, or five activations so, stored up if I'm able to get that much mana. I can start the whole chain with Felden's Cane. I can Felden's myself, and they can say, okay, well, I'm going to Tormod's in response. And that's when I start cracking Oriok. Maybe sometimes, depending on the situation in the grave, they might not even bother to be like, okay, just return it. And yeah, maybe I, that'd be a gotcha moment for me, but in the very least, it's good against Mill. Um, we have the original artifacts that were in here uh, for artifact creature category. Shield Sphere and Ornithopter, their only function in the deck is chump blocking. It's really great to have cheap creatures that you're able to, for two mana, just recurably, recurably play. So depending on like the board state, if, if people are being very aggressive, which you tend to get a lot of aggro, um, it's just nice to have you know, two mana to chump block every turn, especially if it's flyers. And the, new the two newest uh, creature additions, which are really great for the recursion category, are Universal Automaton, which is another changeling. This um, actually helped me pare down, it helped me justify paring down the other changelings. There were two white changelings before that I liked, they were good. Um, but the fact that this is enabling for my little cheeky combo, it's just nice to have something that recurs. I don't really mind that it's a one butt, that it dies to everything, because I'll just spend the extra mana and I'll just return it. If, so if I happen to mill myself in any way or someone else mills me or I just slowly eventually played the cards and my graveyard is stacked, I'm able to just use Oriok to get back this and one of the two uh, changeling enabled um, artifacts. Ginger Brute has proven to be incredible at stealing Monarch and one of the sub strategies is just uh, pillowing up with life gain. So the fact that you can just spend, yeah, it's an extra, it's five mana total to gain three life which is kind of a low rate without drawing cards as well. But the fact that you can also have it as a blocker, and most importantly stealing Monarch by making him unblockable, it's great. And he can, he can poke for one damage. Um, I'm very, very happy with Ginger Brute. That is actually it when it comes to the artifacts you can recur. So every single artifact in the deck is inherently a payoff card. But these I categorically consider payoff cards. So it's payoff for payoff. The pretty big no-brainer is extort. I'm able to spend one extra mana every time I loop something. Don't really care what I loop. Probably just want to spend the least amount of mana. Something like the original, like the uh, chromatics, chromatic star and chromatic sphere. Um, yeah, just take the extra mana and just extort everyone. If there's four people at the table, then you're gaining three in each each opponent is losing one for every single egg you recur. This pisses people off. These get removed so fast it's unbelievable. Um, this, yeah, this is how you get targeted. So some, you, you honestly want to hold on to these until you have a big explosive turn where even if people hate it off the board, uh, you, you're able to stabilize. Um, cards I love just as much. Student of the Ojitai has done so much work for me. I'm gaining a little bit less life than the extorters and I'm not hurting anyone, but yeah, it, it generates less threat, and it is a four-toughness creature. So was Basilica Guards, which is harder to kill. Um, but
but the fact that this costs no mana for me to, to do it, I can do my regular loop for a card advantage, which is what I prefer to do, and also incidentally gain two life. Uh, that doesn't work with Ginger Brute, but it works with basically everything else you loop. Golem Foundry is probably considered a win condition. Uh, it doesn't usually really get to that point because people don't really use their artifact destruction on you. So if they've had it stored up waiting to somehow mess you up, Golem Foundry is a pretty good target for it. But yeah, sometimes you, you top deck it and you slam it and you loop a whole bunch of times on your turn and you have, you have nine counters that you're willing to burn at instant speed or right before your turn starts you can swing out with uh, three, three, three golems. This can get out of hand quickly. I have a few other creatures, uh, some of which I'm still testing. Um, let's start with that one actually, Coalition Honor Guard. I know I love this card, it's in a few uh, of our decks in, in the PDH PAL deck uh, compendium. Um, I haven't actually gotten to, I don't even know if I've resolved it once, maybe I've resolved it once since I put it in this deck. I, um, I don't know, I just like the idea of, I know Oriok has a magnet attached to his head, I, I know that people want to destroy him. So it's just nice to have another creature that's the same stats. If, if, if it would have killed this, if it could have killed this, it will kill this instead of this. So it's just nice to have a bodyguard for my Oriok. Should be good. Palace Sentinels, Monarch is a huge part of our format. Um, nothing, else, us, <clears throat> nothing else much to say there. It's just incredible to have any sort of draw effect in uh, Mono White. And <laughs> there's a sub theme. Well, most of my creatures are two fours. Except for these two. Kozilux Channeler, Eldrazi Devastator. So up until extremely recently, I was running both Ulamonk's Crusher and Eldrazi Devastator. And I decided that both are good, they're both incredible with this deck, since you do uh, intend on assembling Tron as much as possible, or just, you know, standing by and just uh, dumping a lot of mana into cards. It's nice if, if people are actually disrupting to the point where you can't do anything, it's, it's nice to have an Eldrazi in hand, ready to pl be played, once you can't just loop some cards. But the worst thing that can happen to you is if you draw both a Devastator and a Crusher, and I decided that I would rather have a creature that doesn't have to attack every turn. Annihilator 2 on an 8-8, incredible, absolutely incredible, but Devastator, when everyone wants to attack you every round, just having that 9 butt and being able to block makes him more valuable for me in this deck. So I, I opted into him instead. Kozilek's Challenger, um, Channeler. Four Toughness is basically indestructible in our format. You have to spend a significant resources to deal four damage to something. So just having something like this is, is both threatening offensively and defensively, and it helps with your strategy. I can just play it um, as a blocker if I want, maybe to close out the game in the very, very late stages of the game. But realistically, it's just another uh, mana rock. It's just another mana accelerant creature. One card for two mana is always good. Self-Assembler is incredible for getting my changeling creature that I showed you earlier. It is also good at getting this other changeling, Irregular Cohort. I opted into this over my two other changelings that I had in the original build. Um, because it's just great. It, it gives you two creatures for one card. There's not much else to really be said about that. Uh, this, 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 the reason I run Self-Assembler is the same reason I run Kozilek's Channeler. A 4-4 four, for four, 5 is just a decent card. Having cards that cost colorless mana is also very beneficial, because I'm usually really tied up on my white mana, spending all of it on Oriok Salvager's ability every turn anyway. If you guys didn't remember, this is what I was talking about, Universal Automaton. So this card can search for either of these. Uh, and this is the one I'm able to recur. So if I do this, I almost always want to search for this. Because in the extreme late, late game stages, of the, um, extreme late game, you, you would just spend extra mana to return this so that you can start gaining life and drawing cards. Or while you're discarding people, also burning them for three. These are the last two creatures, I believe. So pretty creature light deck. And these are part of my aura package. Um, it's very consistent. Almost always I search for the same two cards, and I'll show them to you in a second, but these are just creatures with an ETB. Search for an aura. Don't really care about how much they cost. They could be uh, one ones for eight. I'd probably still play them. Let me get into the auras. So almost all of these are removal, this first little chunk. 
Oh, this isn't just uh, auras. Here we go. This is the card I search almost always, Crown of Awe. There's a wimpier version, Shield of Duty and Reason. The reason why I like these cards is because they're functionally like three copies of my deck with the tutors. So I'm able to search for Crown of Awe, and for one card, I'm able to give my Oriok Salvagers protection to two colors. This is Enchanted Creature, gains protection from both black and from red. And this one is blue and green. So depending on the situation, I can draw one or the other. Um, I like this one because in, even if there's only one person at the table with either of these colors, you can put it on a changeling and use a second ability. The Sacrifice Crown of All, Enchanted Creature and other creatures that share a creature type will also gain protection from black and from red until end of turn. So that's nice for turns where I want to block or if I want to protect my creatures, maybe all my humans, from a board wipe, from a pestilence or something. Assuming they don't have extra mana to, to burn me in response. Um, one of the cool things is if someone puts an enchantment on their creature and I have a changeling, I can just sack Crown of All on my changeling to destroy their aura. Um, that's a neat little trick I can do. That's what's, that's what's so cool about the changeling. This is the card I was saying is uh, part of the sub-theme. The, the reason I like this card is because green creatures are big, so it's nice to be able to just put it on a creature and be able to block. Um, but one of the neat tricks is you put it on a creature that people are going to want to ghostly flicker. You can't ghostly flicker a creature enchanted with shield of duty and reason. So for one white mana, being able to just turn off your combo if you have to slowly build it, obviously you're able to keep it in hand and just play it turn up. I can't do anything about that. But if, if you're slowly building it up, I would love to put this on a mnemonic wall and you're unable to ghostly flicker or displace. And yeah, of course, again, I can just put it on my Oriok Salvier to protect myself, be able to block anything you throw at me. So it's just nice to have these two options. With one tutor, use one card to block more than one person at the table is very, very useful. I do run two other cards that give me protection. There's an instant as well, but these are the other two auras. Uh, Pentarch Ward. This is a card I rarely search for, and the, the game I actually played today, uh, I did finally use this for the first time in a while. I searched for it over anything else, because I only needed protection from one color, and I just wanted to draw a card. So I was happy to just spend, um, mind you, all these other two cost two mana or one mana each. So I was happy to spend one extra mana just to draw a card in that situation. And that's the real benefit. There are times where I would want to, um, say, put a Crown of All on my creature, and then I need protection from white later, so I would sack Crown of All, and then choose white on, on Oriok and be able to uh, maintain both benefits at least for a turn. So that's what these are nice. These, these are the cards that give me for protection from white, where these other two are incapable of giving protection from white. Chomanos is one of the best cards in the format. Um, it, it sucks because you're searching for it, so the, the surprise gotcha factor of giving a creature protection in response to removal, in response to being blocked, in response to uh, not being blocked, uh, whatever. Um, just being able to pick a color at instant speed and enchant your creature, incredible. Uh, I do not search for this that often. I, I do sometimes because uh, there's a really nice benefit, secondary benefit to having it only cost two mana. When I'm sitting with Oriok Salvagers, in a lot of situations, I'll just keep two mana up and either bluff, bluff that I have instants in my hand, or in many cases I actually have instant speed cards in my hand that I would want to use that two mana on. And if I never have to, then hey, why not just go ahead and return any old egg chilling in my graveyard that I wasn't necessarily going to spend my mana on but it'd be nice to, to build some value, something that like searches for a land or maybe, maybe even uh, draws me a card. So where Crown of Awe is one of the cards I almost always search for, there is a card that I almost always search for more. Temporal Isolation. This might be my single favorite removal spell in the entire format. Um, hard removal isn't necessarily the best. Because in Commander, if you destroy someone's Commander, they're just able to, a turn later, maybe two turns later, depending on their curve, uh, just cast their Commander again, no big deal. It's kind of nice to just turn off their Commander, where what they need to do, instead of just waiting for more mana, which, you know, a third of people's decks is lands, they can just eventually get there if enough turns pass. Especially with my strategy, where there will be extra turns. I, I will be hard to kill unless you're actively all focusing me down. But keeping a Commander in play and turning off its damage that's just kind of enough. So it's two mana, instant speed, I can do it in response, so it's like a fog, 
which has also been proven to be very good, but it's, it's a pacifism fog. It's incredible. The newest card, or one of the newest cards in this deck that was printed is Reprobation. Uh, when it comes to sorcery speed removal, when it comes, and, and uh, talking about filling that category I was just saying, not actually killing the commander, commander is great. Reprobation is the best at it. It makes the creature lose all abilities, it makes the creature lose every creature type, and also makes its toughness one. That might be the worst part. If it made a 0 4 or a 0 10, it might be better. 0 1 means someone's answer to your reprobation might just be I'll pestilence myself and then I'll recast my commander. But other than that, um, it's incredible. And yeah, maybe sometimes you want to hard remove the creature. Doing something that does 2 damage, one of your eggs that does 2 damage, now hey, you made it a 0 1, you're able to shoot it down with an egg. So th this is something I can search for in a lot of situations. Again, face fetters, same category. You're just turning off the creature. This isn't necessarily as good because in a lot of cases it is just a pacifism. It is just activated abilities, so if they have like triggered abilities and stuff, it doesn't stop them. But the fact that it also incidentally gains you life is really great. So if I have plenty of mana and I'm tutoring for an aura, or if I just happen to have this, it's just nice to do something that disrupts you and stabilizes me a little bit because almost always I'm spending my mana to pad my life anyway. So I figured this was worth uh, including. So these are removal. Some people make fun of us, but I openly embrace it. I love some of the unhinged cards, uh, maybe too much. Go to jail is maybe one of the most fair, because yeah, I could just run Journey to new Nowhere and spend one more white mana uh, to get almost the exact same effect. But in some cases, uh, you don't even necessarily want the creature, you, you're happy with the creature to come back. So for those who don't know, every single unhinged card, especially white commons, uh, go to jail is you exile the creature until you roll two doubles on two six-sided die. Two six-sided dice. So until you roll two ones, two twos, two threes, and so forth, your creature is exiled. So yeah, worst case scenario, you play it, and then at the start of their turn, they roll doubles and they don't get their creature back. Um, but my favorite thing about it is in the very least it's a tempo play. The rules of commander say if you oblivion ring a creature, uh, their commander, sorry, then they can just go ahead and take that commander tax and cast it from their command zone. And if the creature dies again, even if go to jail or oblivion ring aren't, um, what, aren't the reason why the commander's in the command zone, if, you, if they are able to destroy either of these, then they'll get their commander back into play for free. Just like when it destroys itself. But the cool thing about go to jail is it's tempo. If they just want to recast their commander, you're actually beating them in tempo, which is something you don't really get to do since you're usually grinding the game to a halt. Sometimes that can pay off, but almost always it's just fun enough where people don't hate you for removing their creature, which is kind of a benefit in and of its own. Oblivion Ring, oh yeah, and both these have the same benefit where it's not on cast, it's on enter the battlefield. So if somebody wants to counter it, they need to, they need to suspect what you're going to remove. So they have to be proactive or they have to negotiate with you. Hey, you know, I won't counter that if you don't exile my creature. Something like that. So Oblivion Ring is really good. Uh, you slam it down. And if people can sack their permanents, they might sack in response. Because once this resolves, then you just choose the target and it gets exiled. It's already too late. You can't respond. So that's why Oblivion Ring is good and by extension go to jail. One of my favorite cards, and I said this in my Nyx Weaver deck tech, which you guys should check out. Seal of Cleansing. This is the white version of Seal of Primordium. Um, one of my favorite cards in all of PDH. Um, I, I run either of them or both of them in every deck I can because I just love the idea of having open information. If this is chilling on the board. People are just hesitant to do anything that threatens you because they know at any point you can just crack this. Anything aggressive that they can do that involves an artifact or an enchantment, which is a lot of bases to cover, they're just going to try to not get on your bad side until you get rid of it and then, yeah, you're back on their shit list. So it's just nice to have that open information. Um, it's not that powerful in this deck. I mean, it's a standalone powerful, that's why I run it. It's not as powerful, because once I cast it and once I sack it, it's gone forever. There's no real recursion like there is with basically everything else in this deck. So that is it for my enchantments. <clears throat> so here's a few instants. There's one hard removal, afterlife. Destroy target creature, it can't be regenerated, they get a 1-1 flyer. So again, it's, it's borderline political, especially with Monarch floating around. People are happy to attack with a flyer and steal Monarch. So you don't necessarily have to 
have everyone hate you when you use a Doom Blade on them. Um, but can't be regenerated is actually a really big line of text in our format. Some of the best cards in our format uh, regenerate or enable a regeneration in some way. So if you want hard removal, it, 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 it isn't really hard removal unless it says the creature can't be regenerated. I just think this is worth it. it it's, instants are so unexpected in this deck, and they are so enabling for the strategy where everyone knows every turn you're just getting value, value, value. They see your full hand, they just assume it's full of lands or just random cards you've been pulling that don't do much. Occasionally you draw a really powerful um, pithing needle of a turn where you, where you just hit him where it hurts. And that's where I would say Lapse of Certainty is insanely good. So Counter Magic is good, Counter Magic is even better when everyone at the table assumes you can't even do it. So everyone knows this card exists. I mean, sometimes people see it come. There's, there's some really great VODs where Drixis just says you have a la lapse of certainty, and then I did, and I cast it, and it was a really powerful moment. It was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's just a counterspell. But the downside is you're putting the card on top of their library instead of their graveyard. And this might be... So it's, yeah, it's only tempo for the most part. If someone's going to fireball you for all their mana on their turn, this will save you a turn. That, that'll, that'll buy the round. And then everyone can work together to kill that player before they get to resolve the fireball. But most importantly, it's a hard counterspell with Ghoul Caller Spell. So this is one of the really juicy two-card combos that uh, really helps justify this because I know this card is obscenely powerful and I refuse to take Ghoul Callers out. So it's just nice to have uh, another justification for a card I love so much. So I have uh, two cards that make people mad. And uh, yeah, they t speak for themselves. War Report and Riot Control. Um, Riot Control is great. It is a fog that also protects you from fireballs. Sometimes uh, Pestilence is the way you die the turn of. Uh, sometimes you get fireballed in the face. Um, it's really just black and red that are doing non-creature damage, but it's, nobody really expects you to just completely negate. It's, it's basically a, it's another counter spell. There's plenty of fogs in white, um, but with, with losing, without losing the flexibility of protection against fireball, this is always good. Because even if you're not protecting from a fireball, it's functionally, it's just another fog, you're paying extra mana for it. But no matter what, even if you're not fogging, you can gain one life for each creature um, my opponents control. So if everyone's actually threatening you, actually ganging up on you, and they're, they're pushing your clock, Riot Control only becomes better the more threaten, threatening, uh, the more people threaten you. War Report, however, yes, you heal more based on how many creatures and artifacts uh, everyone controls, including your opponents. But most of this life, or a disproportionate amount of life, is coming from you yourself. If you cast an artifact creature, which I have a handful of, uh, five I think, artifact creatures count as two, because they're both artifacts and creatures, you, you gain two life per. But everyone's playing mana rocks, there's artifacts on the, on the board. It's, it's not uncommon for War Report to heal for 40 or more for just four mana. These are the huge gotcha cards that you save until the moment you're actually dying. Because if you play them any earlier, everyone's going to very quickly negate that, that, life, that, that life, lane you, <clears throat> life gain you just had. Dawn Charm, it's another fog. Uh, almost always is used to fog, but it's very nice because it also regenerates a creature. Um, and it has another great benefit of countering fireballs. If someone targets you, with a fireball, the last line says, counter target spell that targets you. So that's just yet another answer to the, this board state uh, that you're just piling up life and people say, oh, well, I can get around his, his four butt creature blockers just by you know, jumping over them with a spell. No, uh, I, I have enough instance or enough, there's a few other cards in here that give me enough assurance to one or two of those effects. Prismatic Strands is just an extremely powerful card. If, if you play actual Popper, not just Popper Commander, uh, this is one of the most powerful cards in the format. So prevent all damage that sources of the color of your choice would deal this turn. Again, this protects from fireballs, but it also protects you just from, like if someone's just going on with a huge uh, green Stompy deck, you just say green, it's a fog, that's great. And being able to cast it again, you don't really care about your creatures. They're only sitting there untapped so that you can block. So tapping a white creature, which, I'm a white deck, um, to do this again, you're getting so much value. Um, it's just incredible. It's also nice because if it's chilling in your graveyard, people might aggressively blow up your grave so that you can, you know, you can just go ahead and start using your mana on Oriok Salvagers. 
It's, it's just really nice. So <clears throat> the first sub-theme was Lens of Clarity with Ghoul Colors Bell. The, the start of the video, the two little silly cards I had. So this is one of the small sub-themes. The other small sub-theme was Changelings. And here is the third small sub-theme. So there's this card, Protective Sphere. Very much love this card. Uh, it's one of those obscure cards I refuse to cut that might necessarily be justified, uh, but I'm doing enough with the rest of the deck to, to basically ensure this is an extremely consist a kiss <clears throat> consistent source of uh, damage prevention. So you're stacking up all this life gain, and you're spending a lot of mana and card advantage, and you're not protecting yourself in any way. Sure, you have a few 4-buck creatures, but if somebody plays a 5-5 five, five, or a 6-6, six, six, there's going to punch through. Um, this says pay 1 mana of any color, and you prevent the damage that would be dealt to you by a source of that choice. But that color that you spent has to match that. So I have to spend a black mana if I want to pr protect myself from a black creature. I'm on a white. The only way to generate black mana is through a few tricks. I'll show you once I get into the mana base. Um, but so that's one of the, the cheeky little combos is enabling this because there's a functional second card for consistency that does a very, very similar thing. This says pay one mana and one life, but I have to pay the colored mana. This says pay one white mana and two life to do the same thing. The next time a source of damage of your choice would deal damage this turn, prevent that damage. So having two cards that are functionally the same, they're both equally enabled in this deck. That's just consistent. Um, the only real reason I'm able to lock down the game so hard very late is if people have already cast all of their artifact enchantment removal um, and, and we're late enough where I actually have enough life and mana to just pay for these. This can just grind the game to a halt. And if we're in top deck mode, I win because I just dump my mana so efficiently into digging through my deck for whatever I need or just more value. Uh, when it comes to the last of the little shield walls, little uh, pillows, is Gossamer Chains. I've actually seen a few people play this in real EDH decks. I'm, I'm sure they're not competitive EDH decks, but it's just nice uh, because it's basically the best counter in the game to commander damage. It just says return it to your hand to prevent the damage from an unblocked creature. So yeah, you don't block. Maybe that's abusable if they somehow have a counter to this. <clears throat> but the, the, the real benefit is you're able to cast it over and over and over again. So I spend two mana on my turn to protect myself from any extremely heavy hit. And I'm just able to do it once per round, just cast it every single time. If I happen to have extorters, then that's just another real benefit to returning it. Um, so these are the really big three, like everyone gets pretty frustrated once you have one and you resolve it because the game, the game's kind of bogged down until people draw some removal. So now we can get into the last part, we can kind of blaze through it, it's the mana base. We run the juicy mana rocks. Uh, we want to run these because one card that gives you two mana is extremely good. I'm just trying to get up in mana as fast as possible. and. Um, yeah, four mana for two is a very good rate. These are played in a lot of decks. My two favorite mana rocks, or perhaps just the two best mana rocks that aren't those two that make two mana, are Pristine and Araska Relic. They're just good because they both gain life. Uh, Pristine Talisman has been a PDH Pal's favorite forever. Um, once, once I found out about it, I basically put it in every single deck. Um, Araska Relic was an instant favorite because it's a very uh, interesting version of Pristine where it does give you three life when you activate it. You have to sack it, but it also lets you draw a card. So just having a mana rock that has any sort of late game benefit is extremely useful. So those, are, uh, those are the only cards, the only mana rocks I have that make colorless. They either make two mana or they do something else extra. So this is where we start justifying Protective Sphere. So again, I want to make mana of colors other than white. So that's the benefit of these two rocks. Like, yeah, my commander is four mana. I could lean hard into casting my commander faster, but I actually don't really want to cast Oriok Salvagers until turn six, or until I have six mana anyway, because I want to play him and be able to use the mana to get back an egg. So I don't mind just piling up eggs every turn, or maybe cracking a few to, to get whatever value they have. And then once I have six mana, slam down Oriok and just go ahead and get back the juiciest one. So I'm, it's not important to me to have this perfect little curve. I just want, ex I want uh, particular needs met out of my mana acceleration. So that's the real benefit of these, is both of these, this one lets me tap 
with no downside lets me tap for any mana an opponent could produce. So this says I have to spend mana to protect against a color. If you have a green creature, you had green mana to play to begin with. So I'm able to protect myself if I have a Felwar stone. So um, you get a similar effect here with Prismatic Lens where, yes, you have to go minus one mana. You're just filtering, but you're capable of it. So yes, you can just accelerate the mana and use the colorless mana to cast artifacts. But in situations in the late game where you have Protective Sphere, there's plenty of situations, especially once you've assembled Urzatron, that you, you want to filter your colorless mana into colored mana. So that, that is always useful, regardless of trying to do the Protective Sphere um, synergy. The last two mana rocks, they're just good enough. Um, I wanted a certain number. And I, I do kind of ebb and flow a little bit on this, this ratio, but Mana Geode, when I saw it, I was like, that's an instant include. Scrying for one is insane. When you don't have draw, scrying uh, only gets more value. So yeah, it's just extremely useful to, to just have a mana lift that has an ETB ability. Um, Dark Steel Inga is great because it's indestructible. They both tap for any color, so that's also useful for the, the color fixing protective sphere. So that's it for my mana acceleration. Now we're down to the last little bits where we have our lands. So I've already shown you guys uh, the Urzatron. We have uh, the posts, Glimmer Post and Cloud Post. Um, when you have both of them together, you get extra value, either gaining extra life or tapping for extra mana. Here are four lands that filter. You, you tap, they either tap for colorless or you pay one extra mana to filter. There's two artifact lands that if I happen to mill them or if someone makes me discard, they're the first easy choice because I'm able to recur them with Oriok. Not much else to say there. Secluded Step. Um, I'm actually not the biggest fan of spending mana to draw cards because I already have my eggs. I'm happy to do it um, for no card, uh, card advantage loss. But this is nice because sometimes you want to search your deck with Expedition Map for draw. So I, I'd spend as much mana as I want. So if I happen to draw this, I'm happy to spend one mana just to cycle it. Um, but that's the justification, justification as to why I don't run the other two cycle lands, the, the two that cost two mana, because I'm happy with this one. Uh, I don't really care to draw it. I just want to search for it with Expedition Map. And that's actually the justification for Sahiri Step. So Sahiri Step, yeah, sometimes I just want to get rid of a, an aura that someone put on Oriok that's shutting him off. So I'll tutor for this with an Expedition Map and just give it protection from whatever color aura, and then now Oriok's alive. It's just nice to have some cards that you'd want to search for with Expedition Map. And the last, uh, last non-basic land is Desert. In monocolor decks, this is an easy include. There, there's also Quicksand. I chose not to run that because I don't want to go down in lands ever. And then I just want to show off that I have a whole bunch of full art oil signed lands from Jung Park. So thank you for that. And that's, that's it, that's the deck. I know I'm gonna get some flack from my friends for it being so long, but everyone know it probably was gonna be a little bit long because I love this deck so, so, so much. Um, thanks for watching, love you guys.